meeting is now live. Right, it's now 10 o'clock, so we'll start the meeting. Uh, thank you all very much for taking part in the meeting. Good morning. Welcome to this meeting of the Place Overview Committee. I am Councillor Joyce Barrow, Chair of the Committee. I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee members experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately ring the support telephone number they have already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use it for anything else. As chair, I will interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of remote participation with advice from the monitoring officer prior to making a ruling. At the start of the meeting, I will ask members of the committee to confirm their presence and any disclosable pecuniary interests they have in any of the items on the agenda. I will ask everyone invited to speak during the meeting, including members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves each time before they speak. I'll now do a roll call uh, and disclosable pecuniary interests. Members are reminded to disclose any pecuniary interest in any matter to be discussed, which is not included in the register of interests and leave the meeting prior to the matter being discussed. I'll start with myself. I have no interest to declare. I will now read out each member's name and ask them to confirm that they are present and if they have any interests. Andy Boddington. Councillor Andy Boddington, Ludlow North, no interests. Thank you. Julian Dean. Uh, yeah, present, no interest to declare. Rob Gittins. Present and no in, in uh, trusts, Chair. Simon Harris has sent apologies and Nick Bardsley is very kindly substituting. Um, <coughs> Nick Bardsley, uh, councillor for Wrighton and Bass Church, um, substituting today, uh, no interests. Paul Milner. Paul Milner. We'll move on, Dan Morris. Present, no interest. Pam Mosley. Councillor Pam Mosley, Muckmore in Shrewsbury, no interest to declare, thank you. William Parr has sent apologies and Gerald Aiken is substituting. Gerald? Nope, okay. Paul Wynne? Present, no interest. Okay, thank you very much. If um, Paul Milner does join and Gerald, um, perhaps somebody could let me know, please. Thank you. Please can I check that the following portfolio holders, officers and guests have been able to join the meeting. Councillor Gwilym Butler, portfolio holder for Communities, Place, Planning and Regulatory Services. No. Nope. Councillor Dean Carroll, portfolio holder for Adult Social Services and Climate Change. I'm present Chair. Thank you. Councillor Steve Davenport, portfolio holder for Highways. 
Mark Barrow, Director of Place. Uh, I'm present, Chair. Thank you. Steve Brown, Head of Transport and Environment. Uh, present, Chair. Matt Johnson, Strategic Projects Executive Manager. Uh, good morning, Chair. Present. Thank you. Hayley Owen, Interim Head of Economic Growth. Morning, I'm present. Thanks, Chair. John Campion, Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, present and interested in uh, uh, your meeting, Chairman. Thank you. Chief Inspector Mark Riley, West Mercia Police. All present. Good morning, Chair. Daniel Webb, Scrutiny Officer. Good morning, Chair. I'm here. Sarah Townsend, Committee Officer, Minute Taker. Good morning, Chair. Yes, I'm here. And I have asked if James Walton could join us. Do we know if he's going to join us? Uh, it was very last minute. Uh, regrettably, Chair, uh, I'm afraid James is uh, otherwise uh, occupied in other meetings. Very sorry. OK, thank you very much. I'll now return to the agenda. Uh, item one, apologies. And as I already noted, councillors Simon Harris and William Parr have sent their apologies. Councillor Nick Bardsley is substituting for Simon Harris and Councillor Gerald Dakin is meant to be substituting for Councillor William Parr. Is uh, Councillor Dakin with us yet? No. OK, thank you. Uh, can the committee officer confirm if there are any other apologies or substitutions? I haven't received any. Thank you. Item two uh, we've dealt with, which is disposable pecuniary interest. We will now move on to item three, the minutes of the meeting. And I'd like to move that the minutes of the place overview committee meeting held on the 3rd of September 2020 are circulated with the agenda papers be signed as a correct record. Does, uh, can I have a seconder, please? Yes, I'll second it, Paul Wynne. And I will now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone else indicates differently. Thank you, everybody. We'll move on to item four. Public, oh, actually, do we need to take a vote on those minutes? Do we need people to uh, pass them? Daniel? Yes. Yes, we do, Chair. OK, could we take a, a vote on that, that please? Uh, unless anybody says otherwise, I will take it that that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item four, public question time. We have four public questions which have been received and uh, I will read them out and ask officers to respond to each of them. Uh, I'm happy to read them out, Daniel. Save you. Question one is from Peter Clare, member of Sir Latin and Gaboin Parish Council. Remarkably, no mention was made in the course of the September the 3rd meeting of the plight of those Shropshire residents, some in our parish, who have the misfortune to live adjacent to one of the county's tractor riddled narrow lanes. Not only do these householders often suffer the constant vibration of increasingly large agricultural vehicles, but in some cases, the fabric of their dwellings is being undermined and seemingly they have no redress. Does not Shropshire Council have a duty of care to such council taxpayers in these circumstances? And I'd like to invite Steve Brown to respond. If you can say what your position in the council is as well, Steve. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Steve Brown, Head of Transport and the Environment for uh, Shropshire Council. Uh, and the response is it should be recognised that many agricultural vehicles have a legal right to use the highway. However, Shropshire Council is aware this at times can have a negative impact on those who live in the vicinity. Indeed, it was discussed as a specific agenda item at September, at September scrutiny meeting. This meeting resolved that a working group of Shropshire Council, the National Farmers Union, West, Maiden, West Mercia Police and a representative from the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office would form a working group and seek to, seek to look at improvements or where communications or joint working could improve the situation. 
uh, and this work would be undertaken. Invites for this meeting have been issued and the group will begin its work. Further, a reference group of other interested parties, such as parish councils, uh, uh, will also be undertaken and this, this group's work will support this work. And also just to note that we will be giving some feedback, uh, some further detailed feedback on this on this meeting uh, later in this session. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I think we should add that Mr Clare himself asked if he could be on that reference group and um, that he is included on those members now. Question two from Miss Emma Bullard. I'd like to submit two questions in relation to the report on item seven, Northwest Relief Road. First question, para 3.1 states that there are no practical alternatives in brackets to driving for most trips between the northern and western parts of Shrewsbury, i.e. within the town. What alternatives to driving have been considered for these relatively short journeys within the urban area? Has the evidence as to why no alternatives are practical been published? And if not, Please, could it be made public with the date it was prepared? Assuming that walking and cycling would be among the possible alternatives, why are these not considered practical for many short journeys? Government advice, especially LTN 1 slash 20, which Shropshire Council has approved, and funding supports increased walking and cycling for precisely such journeys, have walking and cycling be considered in light of this? Question two, para 8.3 refers to public and stakeholder engagement on the Seven Valley Water Management Scheme. There are two phases. I, 1st of October, is it number one, October to December 2020 and January, March 2021. What opportunities are there currently or will there be in 2021 for the public to engage with this scheme? I'd like to invite Matt Johnson to respond. And if you can say what your position is in the council, please, Matt. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Matt Johnson, I'm the Executive Manager of Strategic Projects and also overseeing the delivery of the Northwest Relief Road. So in response to question one, um, as regards to alternatives to the construction of the Northwest Relief Road for achieving the wider project outputs around traffic reduction in the town, including the related link to an increased uptake in walking and cycling for shorter trips, also public transport usage. This information is already contained within the outline business case, and this was published in 2017 and sits on the Council's website at a link which we can provide following the meeting. At the point of the submission of the full business case to DFT in due course, the outline business case modelling and the assumptions therein will be further updated and this will note and incorporate the scheme's obligations around LTN 120. The full business case will then also be put in the public domain at the time of its submission. In answer to question two, public and stakeholder engagement around the Seven Valley Water Management Scheme will be undertaken through a dedicated web-based resource plus a range of online events and meetings as required and appropriate to a number of specific audiences. The website is expected to be live by the end of November 2020 and contact, <laughs> feedback and FAQs around the scheme will then be circulated through press communications and general media. Thank you. Have you finished, Matt? I've finished, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Question three from Mike Streetley. I have several questions relating to the report on the Northwest Relief Road that will be discussed on Thursday. Can you please put these to the Council? One, traffic levels. The report on the Northwest Relief Road says that the case for the road is based in part on rising traffic levels, e.g. para 3.2. A. Could the Council confirm what the most recent, e.g. post-COVID, local traffic monitoring and national traffic forecasts have shown regarding the current and forecast traffic levels and how this fits or not? with the traffic growth part anticipated in the outline business case. If the traffic trends have changed, at what point will the Council revisit the business case? B. The report says that an element of induced traffic is included in the traffic modelling 
I cannot locate reference to the factor that has been used in the traffic modelling reports in the OBR. Um, I don't know what OBR is, perhaps uh, in the response somebody could tell me. Can the council please explain what factors it has used to allow for induced traffic? Two, time scales. On the council's website, the plan date for the Northwest Relief Road planning application is May 2020, with construction due to start in spring 2022. The report indicates that the planning application has now been delayed until February 2021, but the planned construction start date has not changed. How is the council able to accommodate these delays into the programme? Three. Budget. In the consultation documents for the North West Relief Road, the budget is stated to be 84.3 million, but in the report, the approved budget is 87.2 million, an increase of 2.9 million, and the forecast is that this could reach 95.7 million. I have several questions regarding the budget. A. Could the council confirm when the 2.9 million increase was approved and what it is for? B, the construction costs are scheduled to come down again despite the specification increasing. Can the council provide more detail as to how these reductions are being achieved? C, could the council confirm whether any other budgets will be affected by the Northwest Relief Road in addition to the spending outlined in this report, e.g. landscaping, other roadworks, etc. And if so, by how much? D. The spend to date is 5.8 million. Could the council confirm how much more money will be spent before construction starts? In the event that the council does not proceed with the road, is any of this spend a reimbursable from the 55.4 large majors fund? Water supply. The council was alerted in 2007 to the fact that the selected route would cross the SPZ1, the 7 Trent Water Shelton water supply, but was reassured by their consultants at the time that it would be possible to make arrangements that would satisfy the water company and environment agency. Can the council confirm whether such arrangements have been agreed with these key stakeholders after 13 years of discussion? Uh, Matt, would you respond, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, in order then, uh, question one, uh, response is uh, local traffic monitoring and wider national guidance on future traffic scenarios, brackets post COVID, are currently being undertaken and prepared. This data and any amendments to the required traffic modelling as prescribed by DFT will be fully acknowledged at the time of the full business case submission. This will be put into the public domain at the time of that submission. Answer to part B. Details of the traffic modelling rationale are contained within the outline business case and this can be accessed through the following link through the Council's website. Um, there is a link to the outline business case which will be provided after the meeting and in particular I'd refer the questioner to Appendix F which relates to local model validation report. Question two, the scheme anticipates up to a 26 week planning determination period and has allowed for call in or public inquiry in its timeline. These factors can therefore be accommodated in the current stated delivery programme. Question three, budget. The overall combined budget for both the Oxon Link Road and the Northwest Relief Road based on our outline business cases, um, that was clarification of the OBR uh, chair, um, outline business case and approved by council is £87.2 million. This figure is consistent with approvals but was misstated within the FAQ summary sheets where the Northwest Relief Road local contribution was undervalued. Part B, through engagement with the SCAPE framework and Balfour BT as primary contractor, detailed design and construction methodologies are now being assessed for opportunities and efficiencies. There also remain wider worst case reasonable estimates as part of the current costings on delivery risks and earthworks. This is to be expected at this stage of a project of such a project and is a prudent and responsible position to take. These costs therefore are also expected to be reduced in due course through further ground investigation studies and detailed design around the structures. Part C, 
All works relating to the delivery of the North West Relief Road project, that includes construction, environmental mitigation works, side road improvements and landscaping, etc., are contained within the stated project budgets. As such, there will be no impact on any wider council budget. Part D. The current budget commitments and annual spend forecast is contained within the North West Relief Road outline business case link provided. The Council is committed to the completion of the road in parallel with the former Oxen Link Road, on which joint costs are also being incurred, in line with the current large local majors programme contract with DFT. This is pending full business case approval. All spend to date, both DFT and local match spend, and to completion is covered in the project budgets. And then question four, which regards water supply. Discussions are ongoing with both Seven Trent Water and the Environment Agency around the SPZ and wider environmental impacts and benefits. And it is expected that through pre-planning engagement with these organisations, that the scheme proposals will be acceptable and compliant with all requirements at the time of the full planning application submission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the next question, uh, I see that Paul Milner has joined us now. Paul, uh, could you confirm whether you have any pecuniary interests in this meeting, please? You're on mute, Paul. You're still on mute, Paul. Can you put your thumbs up if you have no pecuniary interest? Yep, yeah, thumbs up. Thank you very much. And has Gerald Dakin joined us yet? No. I, I don't think he has, Chair, no. OK, thank you, Sarah. OK, moving on to question four, which is from Frank Oldacre, Shrewsbury Friends of the Earth. We have the following questions. Two benefits claimed for the North West Relief Road are that it would reduce traffic in the centre of Shrewsbury and it would improve air quality. To clarify these statements, can we please have answers to the following questions? What are the latest percentage reduction forecasts in the traffic on each of the following roads? Town Walls, Wild Cop, High Street, Shop Latch, Barker Street, Castle Hill and Dogpole. Question two. The annual mean NOx, I assume that's oxygen levels, uh, large N, large O with a little X, level outside the station hotel opposite the railway station has consistently been approximately 40% above the legal limit, i.e. 56 V a legal limit of 40. What is the predicted figure if the road is built? If I can invite Matt Johnson to respond again. Um, I don't know whether you, you would want to come into this uh, at all, Dean, or whether you want to speak later. Shall I pick up the questions, Chair? Yes, um, if, if you go, Matt. OK, thank you. Um, question one. Um, the response is the current forecasts in local traffic levels are contained within the outline business case and also the February 2020 public consultation exercise. These are currently in the public domain through the Council's website. These details will be updated and put in the public domain again at the time of submission of a full planning application and then the full business case. Links to the current assessments are available through below links which will be circulated after the meeting. Question two. Initial assessments on improvements in air quality are also contained within the outline business case. These will be updated in advance of the full planning application and full business case submission also, and will then at the time of submission also be put into the public domain. And I refer um, the questioner to a link which will also provide as regards current details. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. If we now move on to item five, which is member question time. We only have one member question and it's been received from Councillor Julian Dean. And I'd like to invite him to read out his question. Julian, you're up. Yes. yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Julian Dean, uh, Port Hill, Shrewsbury. Uh, for the emergency social distancing measures across Shropshire, what have been the costs and staffing resources deployed so far? Is any of the costs due for reimbursement from government? 
Have officers received any indication as to when tranche two bids for emergency measures will receive a response? When can further consultation with the public be expected for those measures that may become permanent? In particular, the New Street One Way Scheme and associated measures in the Port Hill Shrewsbury Division. Have pedestrian phases on traffic lights been altered to support additional pedestrian journeys and social distancing, in particular at Welsh Bridge Shrewsbury, where the town centre side of the bridge remains a pedestrian bottleneck? Thank you. I'd like to invite Steve Brown to respond, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. The response to uh, Councillor Dean's questions uh, are the cost to date for social distancing measures across shop, uh, Shropshire are £185,726. Uh, staff have been redeployed from other roles across the council to support this work, particularly in the early spring summer period, which was the, uh, the first lockdown. The teams all have also worked in liaison with town councils and our partners in uh, uh, the bids, which are the business improvement districts, to ensure that measures are appropriate and supported locally. Officers meet regularly to ensure a coordinated response uh, to an ever-changing environment and current and meet current guidance. Uh, is any of the cost due, is any of the cost due for reimbursement from government? Government has provided funding to reopen our, our high street safely fund for structure, which was allocated £288,194. Have officers received any indication as, as to when tranche two bids for emergency measures will receive a response? There are no other government grants awarded for the emergency measures. The council is, however, still awaiting a response from the bid that was submitted for the DFT for tranche two of the active travel fund to enhance cycling and walking infrastructure. There has been no official confirmation on when the council will receive a response to that bid. When can further consultation with the public be expected for those measures that may become permanent, in particular the new street one way scheme and the associated measures in Port Hill, the Shrewsbury Division. The current lockdown has required the Council to review the proposals for new street to ensure that they reflect contemporary needs and therefore the Council can't confirm at this time when further consultation will, will take place. Our pedestrian phases on traffic lights have been altered to support the additional pedestrian journeys and social distancing in particular at Welsh Bridge and Shrewsbury and where the town centre on the side of the bridge remains a pedestrian bottleneck. The rephrasing of the light has been considered but was decided against. The council will continue to monitor the situation as the dynamics of travel change and we will reconsider as necessary. Sure. Uh, yes, come in, Ju Julian. Is chat, you, not is chat not working? Um, I can don't see it. Actually, chat is working because I haven't got any messages on chat at all. Yeah, no, it is working. I have it. So, okay. so just a, a quick, quick supplementary on that. So, uh, my concern about over the staffing, which was the second part of the question, was was really related then to the to the last bit about further consultation because in September, beginning of September, um, two members of staff met me kindly on on, uh, on site at New Street and I was then given the impression that, that the next stage of consultation would, would proceed really quite quickly. So within a week or so, it was suggested that we'd be able to put something together to, to, to send out to people based on, on generally a very positive uh, uh, impression of the scheme. You know, generally, it's been, it's been really well received. So I'm just concerned that, that, that we are um, under-resourcing the support for all these emergency measures such that we can't then uh, you know, proceed to, a, to, to, to consultation stages. It, it, it's really concerning that we're now saying that that's not, that's not even on the agenda. I understand why it shouldn't be for this next four weeks. I do get that bit, but otherwise, you know, I'm very concerned that something that I thought was going to happen back in September is now delayed again. Would you like to respond to that, Steve or Mark? Uh, I'm happy to, to respond, Chair. Uh, I do 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 know uh, Councillor Dean's um, uh, point there, and, and I do recognise that. I think it's also important uh, to note that the staff that are undertaking this work are also looking at the other social distancing measures uh, across across the county as well and pulling together 
the work on on active travel and also you know we're involved in putting the bid that went into the department for transport on active travel as well so i do take the point and i, I am pleased that the the temporary measures that we're putting in new street were well received uh, but you know in dealing with the other issues across the county and dealing with uh, the grants and the, the the funding guidance that's coming from national government as well at the moment yes it has stretched it has stretched staff in order to cover all all of those i think we made the point that uh during the last lockdown we were receiving about uh one letter a day from different government departments on on guidance and activities and, and funding requirements and we've had to work those through okay thank you very much um if we can move on to uh item six now which is agricultural vehicles and rural roads i'd like to thank the police and crime commissioner and uh, mark riley in particular for joining us for this meeting uh, Steve Brown uh, is going to provide the committee with an update following the consideration of this item at our last meeting. Uh, off you go, Steve. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just um, a, a verbal update uh, to the committee to note that um, since the September uh, scrutiny meeting where the resolution was passed that we should look at the impact of agricultural vehicles within uh, Shropshire, we've invites have been set, sent out there's the first meeting is organized for the 24th of november at two o'clock and the representatives will be attending that meeting who have already confirmed which is representatives from the uh, police and crime commissioner's office from west mercia police from the national farmers union so the shropshire county advisor will be attending that and also uh, Shropshire Council. The initial sort of terms of reference have already been uh, issued, which is to look at joint communications, to look at um, uh, to look at any guidance, to look at any uh, improvements that could be made, to look at where there's any gaps or, or shortfalls in regulations that we could advise and comment on, and also uh advocate up to um department for transport so uh, that meeting is in the diary attendees have confirmed and also there'll be a reference group meeting as well which will be representatives from town and parish councils from the um, shropshire association of local councils and other interested parties as well which will provide further detailed evidence and provide um, support to that meeting as well with the issues that they bring forward. So the first meeting is on the 24th of uh, November and then we'll be able to start feeding back from, from that uh, point onwards. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say that we've had an enormous, not just myself, but uh, comments on the Shropshire Council webpage. Uh, we've had numerous ones uh, since that meeting uh, and this is a matter of huge concern. Uh, I'd like to bring in, if I may, John Campion, Police and Crime Commissioner, for his comments on this matter. Uh, I do feel at the, uh, the last meeting, um, perhaps we could have had a uh, more positive. I, I appreciate the fact that we're doing the liaison group and I very much uh, thank you for that. But um, I did feel that this particular issue wasn't uh, anywhere near the top of the police's agenda. So if you'd like to speak, John, I'd be very grateful. Are you there? Can you? I just, we just heard a little Hello. bit. Of Hello. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Chairman, because uh, I'm joining remotely. I wasn't sure if I was muted or not. Um, yes. uh, first of all, um, uh, very grateful for the opportunity um, to take part. Our, our roads across West Mercia and uh, Shropshire included um, uh, are the causes of too much harm, uh, both uh, deaths and indeed uh, serious injury. So please do take my reassurance that um, uh, road safety is very top of, of my uh, agenda. Obviously, uh, uh, I uh, look for yours and the Council's forbearance as we go through um, a, a very difficult health pandemic. Uh, but I can assure you that the that the commitment um, is there. Um, the the areas that 
for me, I think are interesting uh, through this, uh, and one that I hope that the working group will, will get at is um, how the different parts can uh, can be drawn together to make the most difference. Um, because I, I do believe in uh, things such as uh, enforcement, I do believe in education, I do believe in the environment, as in the built environment and the design of our roads, and all of the other parts of how we shift um, this uh, being uh, less of a, an issue. So. I'm very keen that the uh, that the work uh, looks to see the stuff that we can do quickly, the stuff that will take a longer term um, uh, amount of time to implement to get the benefit from. But for me, um, I, I think it's a, an important bit of work and uh, I, I look forward to my and my office uh, uh, playing a meaningful part as we go through it. And then ultimately at the end of it, uh, working out what needs to be done and, and supporting getting it implemented. That's super. Thank you very much, um, John. If you do feel you want to come in before we finish this this particular item, uh, if you can just indicate in some way, I think you probably have to talk over the top of us as your remote. Um, we've also got uh, Chief Inspector Mark Riley. Um, I'd be grateful for his comments on the matter as well. I did send you both links to that meeting. I don't know whether you had a lot of time to spend listening to it, um, but hopefully it would have been informative. Uh, Mark Riley. If you'd like to speak. He might not know that he has to star six if he's dialed in that will unmute himself. I think you've just told him. Thank you, John. I'll unmute. Oh, we got you then. We lost you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah fantastic. I apologise for that. Uh, yes, Mark Riley, I'm the Chief Inspector for the Safe Neighbourhood teams for Shropshire Policing Area, West Mercia Police. Um, and yes, we have had a conversation relating to the agricultural vehicles and rural roads, and I can give you my absolute reassurances that I will be present at those meetings, haven't had those invites. So thank you very much for that. Um, in view of where we currently are with West Mercy and agricultural roads, uh, we do have our rural and business officer that works in my department that has great communications with our farming communities um, and the NFU, for, for instance. So with regards to where John was coming from as the PCC last, with regards to education, is a great opportunity for me to have my rural and business officer go, um, go forth and, and educate in relating to the legislation of agricultural vehicles on those roads. We also have an opportunity with education of we don't buy crime officers, and I have two in my department that are able to do that. So that we don't buy crime in view of um, protecting our most vulnerable and going out to our farming communities with, with um, smart water equipment um, for, for, for those vehicles is another opportunity to educate. Now, with respect to agriculture vehicles on the roads, they you know, do, do not deter from um, for what we would deal with normal vehicles. You know, they still have the legislation there, whether they're using a mobile phone, whether they are speeding, um, whether or not um, they are causing other offences. And I would just encourage those to use Operation Snap, um, which is a fantastic opportunity for the public to, to send in those concerns um, via video of their dash cams to us in West Mercia Police. It is a great opportunity for us to see them, to report and to act. Um, so reassurance for me, Chair, I will be at those meetings. There are opportunities for the public to, to feed into us using Operation Snap. And I will have officers from my team that would be very much engaged in view of uh, positive action, education, and trying to reduce our most vulnerable on our roads in protecting people from harm. So please, Chair, you've got those reassurances from me. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, if I can just say that we're not actually going over the whole issue again of um, farm vehicles. This is just an update on the working group and what we are doing. Um, so please, if you have any questions, it should really be about um, what we're doing next, uh, not about particular issues that we're experiencing across the county at the moment. Um, Dan, I see you want to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. It was just a question to um, Steve Brown regarding the reference group that feeds into the main group. What's the sort of feed in mechanism to that? Um, and, um, you know, when when are they meet? Do they meet before or after the main group? And, um, and what's the process for feeding in their, um, their, their you know, their concerns? OK, um, um, thank you, Councillor Morris. Um, the invites for the reference group have, have got to be sent out and that's a task that I've got to do. In my mind, the reference group would meet after the main group. 
where you know the 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 key issues would be looked at we would then you know go to the reference group see what their view of that was see what any information that they would they would raise and what issues uh, might be fleshed out of that and we would use that to sort of steer and provide any sort of local local insight into into that and then we would sort of work together going forward on um, on that basis so invites to go out we've had a number of people say that they would like to sit on the reference group and this is about, about making sure that that local detail and that local feedback you know he, he's pushed in into the the key group and that those issues are are acted upon in the, the forefront of everybody's mind could i ask a follow-up question please Jeff? yes please do um so uh, i wondered if um uh, steve had considered whether or not there should be a parish council representative on the main group meeting to ensure that the um uh, the, the concerns that a lot of these rural, particularly rural parishes have, um, it is not diluted. Um, I wonder whether that had been under consideration. Uh, it has been under consideration, Councillor Morris. Uh, I am not opposed to that. I suppose there is a question of whether a, a representative from SALC would be equally as appropriate in order to feed that back, but it's certainly something that I can take away today. Uh, consider and then and then update but uh, in principle I, I probably think that would be an improvement and, and an advantage and I do take the point. Thank you no further questions. Okay thank you very much. Uh, have any other members want any questions to do with um, the actual process in the group? No, in that case, are there any points that officers John Campion or Chief Inspector Mark Riley wish to clarify? If I don't hear anything from you, John or Mark, I'll assume it's a no. Officers? No, OK. If there are no more speakers, uh, do we have any recommendations? And if so, can I have a proposer and seconder? Um, it's to note really the report, but what we could recommend and, uh, is that we get reports at every meeting after the liaison group has met. Uh, I think I think it would happen automatically anyway, but I, I don't think it would be a bad thing to add those as a recommendation. So may I may I propose that? Yeah, Paul I'll, Milner. Yeah, I, I'm happy to second that chair. And uh, I think what you've said about regular reports, uh, that would be good at each meeting to know exactly where and what the where the problems are in, you know, in particular. OK, thank you. Um, if I don't hear, uh, no one indicates that they're unhappy with that. I'll take that as unanimous. Any indications? No, that's fine. Um, I would like to comment. I forgot to do so when we were looking at the minutes earlier on the excellent minute taking by Sarah Townsend of that particular item. I find it very useful and I think either Dan or Sarah, if you could forward those minutes to John Campion and Mark Riley, it would be extremely helpful to them as well. Thank you very much. We'll now move on. Um, I'm now going to, uh, we will now take, we've taken the vote. Uh, I haven't read names out because we've unanimously agreed it. So we will now move on to item seven, which is the Northwest Relief Road. Councillor Dean Carroll is in attendance for this particular item and I thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Matt Johnson. I do have to leave at 11 though because I have another meeting. Okay, um, well, I think if we can fit you in. What time is it now? 11.43. Um, if we can uh, possibly put you before Matt. Matt Johnson was going to, uh, the Strategic Projects Executive Manager was going to introduce himself now and present the item. But I think as you've got to leave, would you like to speak uh, on the environmental impact and climate change in regard to the Northwest Relief Road? because uh, I'm sure you've been doing an awful lot of work on this before Matt actually gives the report. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll I'll be fairly succinct, um, but you're right, there is an awful lot of work that's gone in to it. I've taken a personal interest in it and our Climate Change Task Force has put an awful lot of work into improving the environmental credentials of the Northwest Relief Road. 
a few points to draw out that are mentioned in the report, but but um, merit further um, thought and consideration is um, firstly the um, the route of the Northwest Relief Road has already been um, slightly changed, has already been amended to offer greater protection to Hancock Pool, which is a site of special scientific interest. And there will be additional mitigation measures and protections put in place for that and other um, SSIs that are close to the route. In terms of biodiversity, in all, can you hear me, Chair? I'm getting all kinds of warnings flashing up that I've got bad network quality. If I turn my camera off, that might that might help. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. Um, in terms of biodiversity, um, there are built into it mammal culverts and reptilian culverts to allow small mammals and reptiles to pass underneath the road to reduce the um, to reduce the risk to them from road collisions. The cycle lane, which is um, which is separated from the main road by a bund will be uh, long and and one of the best cycle paths, specialist cycle paths that we've ever yet been able to deliver in Shropshire. Um, it will cover the full length of the road and coming back to a question that was asked by, I believe, a member of the public earlier about alternative travel arrangements. Um, whilst it's true that for the majority of people, cars remain a necessity to travel from, for example, the north of Shrewsbury to the west of Shrewsbury. We have put in um, this cycle and pedestrian, divided cycle and pedestrian route to make it more accessible and the surrounding countryside more accessible to cyclists and pedestrians. The one of the overriding principles of the Northwest Relief Road is about moving traffic out of Shrewsbury Town Centre. That will have the benefit of improving the air quality in Shrewsbury Town Centre and also of reducing the CO2 impact of journeys from between the north and west of Shrewsbury because it will be reducing the stationary and stop start times that are currently such an issue for vehicles passing through the town centre and will enable them to be far more fuel efficient. I know that there will be, and I've heard criticisms, that if we've declared a climate emergency and we're committed to carbon neutrality, then why are we building new roads? Um, my answer to that is, is, is actually that we can't and shouldn't be attempting to force people out of cars when it's not possible for them, when it's not suitable for them. What we should be trying to do is re initially is reducing the impact of car journeys and also making making um, making greener alternatives to existing cars more attractive. And that's another um, another environmental benefit that we're working very hard on is access to refueling for both electric vehicles and hydrogen powered vehicles along the line of the Northwest Relief Road as it will become a major strategic route. And so we would hope that that would also help to reduce the overall um, carbon emissions caused by, by vehicles. So my response to it is basically that it's not all about the stick, it's about the carrot as well. We're trying to we're trying to move along in a pragmatic way that supports people in their everyday lives, but also makes slow incremental improvements that will help us to arrive at net carbon neutral by 2030. I'm happy to take any questions if they're from more detailed or technical nature. I'll I'll respond to them in writing, but I'm happy to take any questions now. OK, thank you, Dean. Dean, did, I, did you say you were leaving at 11 or 12? 11, Chair, I've got a COVID I thought, meeting at I 11. thought you said 11. Uh, thank you. Uh, has anybody got any questions for Dean? 
I know it's a bit difficult because we haven't had the full report yet. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right, Nick. Nick yeah. Barnsley. If you'd like to say who you are, yes, the team yeah. Nick, Nick Barnsley, Councillor for Wrighton and Baschurch. I represent one of the areas north and west of Shrewsbury that suffers uh, very considerably at the moment from the environmental damage that is caused by rat runs. Um, and uh, uh, forgive me those of you who've heard me say this before, but there is an enormous cost to not building the relief road um, in the environmental damage, not just to uh, villages in my electoral division, particularly right, 11 towns, Baschurch, uh, Walford College, Walford Heath, but neighbouring ones as well. Um, I here, my colleagues Ed Potter and Leslie Picton would say that there is enormous environmental damage caused um, by rat run traffic through Montford Bridge, Fitz and so on. So um, I, I think uh, we always have to see this in the overall context. I totally endorse what Councillor Dean Carroll has said about forcing people out of their cars. It's not going to happen. Um, but also, please let us not forget the huge damage that is being done week in, week out and has been done for many years past through rat run traffic. People travelling from Oswald Street and from points north trying to get to Halscott and Battlefield by the shortest route. And of course, SatNav doesn't help because SatNav will route them through these rat runs um, and uh, people in these areas, north and west of Shrewsbury, are suffering huge environmental damage at the moment, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, I'm just aware that Matt hasn't given his report yet. I have Dan and Paul Milner to come yet. Would you mind very much if I let Matt give his report or are these specifically for Dean, these questions? Uh, uh, Dan? Chair, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, they're to speak after the report's been presented. Great. OK, Paul? Same, same here. Okay. Same here Chair. Right. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, your input's been very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Matt, would you like to give your report and apologies there for holding you up? No problem at all. Thanks very much, Chair. Just, just to uh, reflect on previous comments, I was just going to pick up on a point made by Councillor Carroll there. We are also supplementing the, the usual suite of environmental documents you'd expect at a planning submission with a full carbon report, which we're working with colleagues um, Adrian Cooper as the lead on that within the Council. And uh, we're looking at this point to get a, a peer overview of a draft report we've had produced already that relates to both the operational and the construction carbon impact and that's um, ensuring that's fully aligned with the council's obligations and undertakings around its carbon performance in the next couple of decades so just to clarify that we are fully aware of the carbon agenda something which actually rode in after the fact uh, of submitting the outline business case so, so to turn to the report, um, Chair, is it is it reasonable to expect that people have had sight of this prior to the meeting so it doesn't require a detailed talk Absolutely. through rather a summary? OK, Absolutely thank you Absolutely, a summary, please. Thank you. OK, so um, th thanks for the chance to present to, to, to scrutiny. We've, we, we've been in front of scrutiny before in terms of the governance of the North West Relief Road, clearly a project of this magnitude. There's an expectation, in fact, uh, an obligation that we're engaged with members, engaged with wider stakeholders and also engaged um, with the communities of Shropshire. So we, we give continuing reports on the governance and management of the project. Uh, this was a specific request to update on project pipeline and programme and budget. And there are various elements that have been picked up within the report. There is a um, considerable amount of detail within the report and also links to further documentation at the end. Um, if, if I walk through at uh, some speed in terms of the report and the structure of that, um, looking at section three report itself the background to the scheme itself is is something which has been in the public domain Me members and, and attendees of the meeting will be familiar with the concept of the road for 20 30 40 years prior to the meeting today however um in 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 very brief terms it was um, an opportunity given to the council in 2017 to revisit and reconstruct an outline business case for submission to the the ft as part of the large local majors 
um, competitive bidding round, a national competitive bidding round. Uh, the outline business cases submitted was approved by members for submission and uh, found favour with the FT and we were offered programme entry uh, based on a number of um, parameters and a number of outcomes and outputs that we're now committed to contractually to deliver by 2024. Um, there is um, a, a long list of those outcomes, as were stated previously in the OBC. Um, a lot of those linked to wider contextual developments post-2017. So when we're talking about uh, Councillor Carroll's point as regards the offset in traffic, um, the outline business case is, is, is um, very much set in terms of a DFT expectation of a transport scheme. I think the opportunity the Council seized post that outline business case submission has been to make the links left and right into wider ambitions for the town. So the repositioning of the town centre in terms of its function, uh, the repositioning of certain um, elements of transport movements within the town, acknowledging the big town plan, which has come along latterly, and also the movement piece, which is developing at pace there. So really, this is seen as a 2024 opportunity to actually maximise the, um, the outputs of various parallel schemes the council's also in full support of. So it's been interesting weaving what was a 2017 position into a 2018, 19 and now 20 position. Uh, we've managed to flex the outputs of the scheme sufficiently that we're showing significant synergies now with, um, with other initiatives within the town. So section three really sets, sets the, uh, the terms and conditions of the engagement we've got with DFT at this point in time. There is mention there of key dates. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, contractually obliged to complete by 2024. Um, it's a funding opportunity which doesn't have any flex uh, and also the council's ob obligations in terms of its local match funding have been um, scrutinised and approved by members in previous papers to full council. Uh, so there is therefore the, sub the summary of the budget and an outturn forecast. Um, there is on, um, well, sorry, let me just get my reference, uh, 5.0, there is a, a, a table which I thought it might be worth spending a, a couple of minutes just discussing. Um, as regards the position the project finds itself in at the point of the meeting today. Um, it's entirely reasonable to expect in 2017 that there were forecast costs included in an outline business case, and they'd have been pragmatic and prudent based on worst case scenarios. Um, as you work through a project of this size, there is a timeline which allows you to then further refine and, and um, um, consolidate costs based on further information gathered. If I was to use an example, it would be that of the construction of certain structures, uh, bridges, underpasses, conduits, etc. along the road. We would expect a worst case scenario for building. Um, in very simple terms, that would be unsuitable ground conditions for putting the structure we're intending to put in. Um, post OBC, it's incumbent on the council to go out and do physical surveys ground investigation works, which then resolve the position so we can start detailed design based on an actual known uh, building condition. So to look at a lot of the orange sections which are in there, they are figures which are current estimates, worst case estimates, which are now being refined down from that worst case scenario. So in summary, the, the outturn costs as we sit here today, we have a spread of potential outturn scenarios. Uh, we've got an overspend potential if everything on the worst case scenario comes to pass, which is not to be expected, of um, just over 8.5 million. There's a potential to reduce that overall um, outturn cost considerably. Um, an optimist would suggest that 5.8 million underspend is, is achievable. I think as an officer, it's incumbent on me to suggest that somewhere between the eight and five is where we're going to be. We are obviously um, aiming squarely at a zero overspend. Um, and at the point of reporting today, the figures as, as are clarified in there are now confirmed and we can further com we can come back with further reports as those um, those figures are further clarified. Um, ultimately, the mechanism through which the road proceeds is a requirement to then submit the full business case back to DFT, which will consolidate all of that um, re-estimation work into a final build cost. And we then represent the arguments around traffic modelling, around the outputs on road safety, the outputs on air quality, and there is a further consideration of the scheme by DFT. Assuming success at that stage, we then um, are able to pull down construction funding towards the end of the scheme and that uh, we go into the construction phase. Um, so there's, there's further uh, description in 5.11 and so on as regards cost mitigation approaches, further detail on what's been undertaken there. 
Um, important just perhaps to dwell again to pick on on, on some of Councillor Cowell's earlier points, the environmental approaches that the road's been taking. We've, we've got obligations, written obligations in the agreement to build the road whereby outputs and outcomes are to be achieved. Um, there is a summary um, um, graphic at 6.1 which shows the approach that this scheme is taking. Um, it, it's important to perhaps note that there's a that there's a bare minimum approach that any planning application would have to be um, demonstrating it's taken. It, it's absolutely not the case that the road is looking to take a bare minimum approach. We're looking to maximise the benefits in what's termed a, a net gain scenario. So instead of simple mitigation of an impact on the environment by commensurate uplift elsewhere, Henkert Pool was mentioned as a good example. There's an ambition and a plan to leave a legacy with the scheme, which is actually an overall net benefit in terms of environment. So offsetting certain elements of road construction with uplift in environmental situations and the uh, ecology of the area post completion. So that's all uh, that's all factors which will be consistent, uh, consistent with a successful planning application. That's where we're positioning ourselves at this point. Um, I think we've, we've covered the carbon assessment and the fact that it's mentioned in the report again as regards the um, the um, joint working between the scheme and the council's wider stated commitments. So we're entirely in line with with, with those ambitions. Um, and then I've referred to earlier some of the synergies and some of the opportunities that the road, although not specifically described in the outlined business case, uh, does give the council um, in order to improve on areas around public transport, the current park and ride initiative to, to relaunch, reposition the park and ride within the town in the short and medium term. And also a full acknowledgement now of the big town plans ambitions. Um, there are a lot of synergies, a lot of parallels in, in, in terms of the ambitions of the big town plan and the outputs and outcomes that the, um, the road scheme um, is intended to deliver. There's also economic benefits um, in terms of the strategic connectivity. Um, Councillor Barsley mentioned uh, traffic movements um, across the top of the town. Uh, we, we would be linking um, directly with a seven minute journey time battlefield with the uh, proposed Sioux West, the Welshpool Road proximity of um, sustainable urban extension. Um, clear ambitions to, to maximise the council's receipts and opportunities around those allocated sites in the current local plan. Um, is something which the, the project itself has reacted to in short order, but um, absolutely appropriately and necessarily. Um, the recent announcement of, um, of flood funding through DEFRA to the uh, River Seven Partnership um, and an opportunity which was actually outlined some 12, 13 years ago with a previous um, unsuccessful bid for national funding for the relief road. The ability to deliver the uh, the uh, potentially conjoined scheme, which would not only tackle congestion and traffic issues, but also um, provide an opportunity for an effective delivery of a of a flood water management scheme. Um, the report, at the point of writing this report, states where we are in terms of that process. It's worth acknowledging that the Environment Agency are working at some speed now to get a scheme um, developed, scoped, planned and potential mitigation approaches developed. Um, the offset in the timeline of the Northwest Relief Road, effectively we had a, a planning compliance scheme in July. Um, entirely appropriately, we, we paused on submission of that, that planning application, allowing the EA to, to position themselves so that they can actually collate the resources they now need to develop their own business case and their own plans. Um, we are looking to work with them as closely as we can in terms of joint delivery but pragmatically um, in terms of the council's risk with its existing obligations on the road um, and that end date of 2024, um, there is an expected planning application on behalf of the road alone at this stage, um, but that could um, through a number of planning scenarios be supplemented with um, a separate and then ultimately conjoined application for a flood scheme, which would then allow those efficiencies in terms of delivery, particularly through the, uh, the build and construction cycle. So there is a, a short and um, overview um, list of opportunities and also a, an indicative short term plan timeline, which takes us up to the um, planning application I just described for the relief road. I is obviously incumbent on the scheme and also the River Seven partnership to continue reporting back to council 
on the progress on that work, which is, as I say, at pace, um, being developed on a weekly basis through a number of technical disciplinary meetings. Um, and then finally, the report rounds out uh, what the full business case I referred to earlier uh, comprises of in its submission to DFT and just explains the mechanism through which we revisit the assumptions and modelling estimates made within the outline business case based on revised and refreshed information and data. Um, there's clearly at the point of talking today an issue nationally which was not expected in terms of people's travel habits, work habits and leisure habits. Um, guidance in line with the requirements to acknowledge that through DFT with modelling would obviously be taken into account by the scheme at the point to which that's a requirement both through the FBC, the full business case and a planning application and uh, we await further guidance nationally on that. Okay. Um, and I think that's taken us through to the end. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, thank you. That was very thorough. Um, I'll now ask members of the committee for their comments and please indicate on the chat function if you wish to speak. And please remember that when asked to speak, members should unmute microphones, state their name and re-mute on completion. Um, first person is Dan Morris. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Dan Morris, uh, Ward Member for Bernal. Um, in the report, it states that the, the key strategic objectives of the North West Relief Road um, 2, 3 and 4 are to improve the economic competitiveness of Shrewsbury and Shropshire, to support delivery of a planning growth and development to Shrewsbury and to enhance the benefit of other transport investment. Um, it may not have been the point of this particular report to committee to look at those um, areas in detail, but um, it, ongoing, I'd like to understand and flesh out those particular points more. more. Um, things like what are the projected figures for additional economic benefits after completion? How is the planning department going to be supported to help progress of development alongside these arterial new routes? What thought has been given to what sort of businesses are going to be attracted to these sort of areas? Um, and how is we are the council going to help attract new businesses um, to sort of um, invest in this space? Um, so those are the sort of points I'd like to see um, brought out in, in, in further papers. And I just wondered whether Matt would uh, would comment on that, please. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I, everything you've said there is is what you describe as contextual sort of windfall benefit from the scheme at the moment. Um, just to explain the rationale with DFT, there is um, perhaps frustratingly from a council point of view, a lack of acknowledgement in terms of the business case requirements we have to develop and describe those wider economic benefits and the development opportunities. It's very much focused nationally on a road based output. So it's things such as road safety, journey time reliability and air quality, all of which are laudable. But I think the council's position is such that with the um, current local plan review, uh, we've already already worked close, working closely with Eddie West and colleagues as regards potential future allegations for housing and employment land. Um, there is an offset in the two programmes in that the review was undertaken at a point prior to the North West Relief Road being a confirmed scheme. But we've also um, already got a commitment from that local plan team uh, to continue to review the local plan in the light of the development and delivery of the road. So to pick on the, on the points you made, the economic benefits and the development potential and new business attractor that this road could be, absolutely that's being embedded within other teams as we speak. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Finish Dan, yeah. Okay, Paul Milner. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. And sorry before I was late, I had trouble with ID, so sorry about that, Chair. Yeah, I, I would just ask you, I'd just like to ask really, uh, how, how is the council protected uh, about having any uh, overspend, um, you know, and, and what are the risks of, of the contract being more than what we what we think? Uh, and the other the other question really is, is, is that, is there any incentives uh, for to, to actually not to have uh, overspend uh, on the project? Uh, so it's really how the protected, how the council's protected financially. Thanks, Councillor Miller. Um, the the paper describes the um, obligation within program entry with DFT, the just over nineteen million pounds worth of local match funding, which was agreed through full council. Um, part of the risk that the council inherits at that point is overspend is a council issue. There is no further funding from DFT at this stage. 
However, um, the, the first approach we take as a project is to actually de-risk that from the council's point of view. So to answer your question directly, um, in the original outline business case, we'd envisage quite a traditional approach to procurement for the construction phase, which would be your open market tender. Um, the way that those, those always react to a major project is for that constructor to build in a degree of cost, which is risk that they would take on. Um, if risk doesn't come to pass, we overpay effectively. What we've opted to do at this stage uh, through the council's procurement team advised by Nigel Denton is we had um, an ability to engage with the SCAPE framework, which is a single operator pre-populated framework where Balfour BT are the incumbent operator at this point in time. What that's allowed us to do is to undertake a feasibility and now enter a pre-construction phase whereby it's classed as early constructor involvement. And really in very simple terms, what that's meant is that we, prior to the current lockdown, we actually gen we co-located in my project office and we had the constructor or potential constructor embedded in the design stage. So opportunities around risk were things where traditionally the first thing that they'd be aware of is that there's a tender to build a road in very simple terms. They have seen the mechanics and the design and the challenges and the ground investigations from, from the word go. So they are an incredibly well-informed potential contractor in the future. What we then could potentially do, there is a decision for full council, given the size of the contract to be awarded, is proceed through SCAPE with Balfour Beatty ultimately as the constructor. And we, through SCAPE, can then give a do not exceed price, whereby risk over and above an agreed price is the contractor's sole responsibility. Now, in order to inform that, we continue to work with Balfour Beatty at this point in time. But the way in which that is developing for the scheme also gives an opportunity to bring in the joint ambition for the flood scheme as well, also using SCAPE, so those synergies can be found. Um, to answer your question very directly, the risk approach we've got is to get the contractor within the fold at this point in time and advise and give value engineering suggestions far earlier in the five year programme than we'd expect. Ultimately, the, the, the risk management of this is that we cannot proceed to construction, we cannot proceed to full business case without full member approval. This project will be fully cited or members will be fully cited on the project outturn cost at the point of full business case submission. And as I say, that could be embedded in a do not exceed contract. So all those appropriate checks and balances are in place. So there'll be a full forecast of outturn at full business case, which members will be cited on. Uh, and can I just come back, Chair? Yes. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are what are, what actually are the factors, or what what issues could actually arise to 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 uh, actually go overspend or higher than budget? I know it's you haven't got a crystal ball, but what sort of issues can can make it overspend? Uh, you know, unforeseen issues, sort of thing. There's probably three major areas which which we're working on now. Um, one is the um, the land costs. So the council would have to acquire lands pertaining to building the road and maintaining the road. Um, give you an example of how we've managed to trim costs already. Actually, we, we had at the outline business case stage uh, forecast costs of around 4.3 million for the purchase of all lands required. Uh, we've now undertaken a, a 12 month exercise with landowners and with a land referencing team in order to um, reposition costings around what we now know the design requires. We've managed to take nearly three million pounds out of the budget through that process. So we're ahead of the game in terms of that worst case scenario. Other areas where we are yet to resolve, but we are still on a worst case scenario with an expectation of improvement are things around utilities diversions. So gas, water, electric. There's clear impacts on the current network and those undertakers, statutory undertakers, will be giving us prices for the movement and repositioning of their infrastructure. Again, we went on a worst case scenario and we're now starting resolving costs down. That is still a risk until those costs are established and confirmed with the contractors and the utility companies. And the other risk is the ground conditions on which we are building the road. Um, you know, a, a very simple analogy, you don't want to build on sand. If we found a lot of sand, it's an expensive exercise. So we're now doing the detailed ground investigation work. So again, we've started with a worst case scenario, effectively the sand scenario. And we're now starting to distill costs into something which are um, more predictable and based on the latest ground investigation surveys. Um, all of those three, uh, three areas gave us the biggest potential risk, but actually they're the ones we're now working on at speed to resolve the risks down to a more um, resolved figure. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Julian Ding. Julian? 
Thank you very much, uh, Councillor June Dean from Port Hill in Shrewsbury. Um, initially, I was going to sort of provide some challenge to some of the underlying assumptions, but I'm going to slightly reframe that based on what we've heard so far, which is really around, you know, how far is the outline business case still actually got got credibility? Because you, you know, you, you, it was interesting your comment about, you know, how interesting it's been to weave in subsequent developments. It's beginning to feel like actually. Um, that, that's not weaving in, that's shoehorning in. So, so to just go through that in a bit of detail. So the paper talks about um, you know, that the, the issues with traffic will continue to grow nationally. Traffic levels are starting to rise again after the recession, um, background traffic demand increases, none of which takes into account the fact that government policy has shifted on this. You know, that we are now in a, in a world where there is a general acceptance that that you cannot simply accept continued growth in traffic and that there are alternatives to doing that um, both you know in, in terms of climate but also in terms of in terms of uh, environments so it just feels like that's beginning to be out of date we're also now waiting for uh, the emissions uh, the, the, the environmental impact report um, and we're told that that is going to be a comparison based on a do minimum uh, scenario well nobody's talking about a do minimum scenario we're in climate emergency, so to be comparing with a do minimum scenario and then using that as a, a source of some sort of, you know, positive outcome feel, feels uh, inappropriate. Um, and then to then to so those are the sort of the big issues, and then to bring it to the sort of town issues. And this this comes back to one of the points that Councillor Carroll made. So the report says poor connectivity between the north and west of Shrewsbury for all modes of transport. Well, I, I would simply challenge that. Most of the day. Most of the time, even by car, that connectivity isn't that bad. By bicycle and increasingly by e-bike, if you, if you look at the number of e-bikes that are out there now, it is ridiculous. It's a huge, huge transformation to people's short journeys. You know, that connectivity is actually really good through town. And the idea that people will, you know, will cycle out effectively to join the North West Relief Road to cycle across and then cycle back in somewhere, perhaps to the hospital, you know, it seems to me a bit of a crazy idea. When, when when we could be doing things which we need to do anyway and which we're planning to do anyway, which will improve the connectivity through town for active transport in, in a way that is much more efficient of road space. We know that active transport and public transport is a much more efficient use of road space and therefore of money. Um, so so I suppose what, what where that all leads to is that I'm beginning to feel like the number of the number of things that need to be shoehorned in or changed from the outline business case to the full business case, the fact that we've declared a climate emergency, the, the behaviour changes that you've just referred to in terms of COVID, um, the national policy shifts towards towards modal shift, all of that is it's beginning to feel like the outline business case is is you know that it's just simply irresponsible to be continuing with an outline business case which is increasingly out of date. Thanks, Councillor Dean. Shall, shall I come back on those? I think three points in, in order. Um, going back to the outline business case, um, the, the the approach to an outline business case isn't something that the council sets the parameters on. It's as defined by DFT. So when you're referring to situations such as do nothing, um, the alternative approaches that could have been taken ultimately through to the decision to support the road as the most effective way of delivering the outcomes and outputs. That's a very prescriptive national framework we have to work within. And that allowed obviously the, the competitive bidding element. So it's comparing apples with apples at the point at which they were making the award structure council. Now, the outline business case was a moment in time in 2017, um, hence the protocols in DFT to revisit that with a full business case. Now, we're in uncharted territory here in terms of the way that the national picture around movement and carbon is being defined. I fully agree with you there. Um, what we will have to do, though, is incumbent on us to continue to follow the national requirements for stating our case, measuring the outputs and measuring some of the baseline data. Now, if, for example, the background traffic growth that you've mentioned, we, we assume and inherit figures which we're given nationally. We can augment that with local studies because every town has a unique um, geographical location. But ultimately, a lot of the multipliers and the factors that a model traffic model would have to have to acknowledge are set nationally. Now, we do expect DFT to be revisiting and there is work at this point in time on a, on a post COVID scenario. And if that is the case, we will acknowledge that in our traffic modelling. So we're consistent with national guidelines and we'll be restating a full business case based on the requirements that that sets. But at the time of talking to you here, that isn't yet published. So the point at which it changes is the point at which we'll have to adapt and change our approach. 
Um, in terms of the, um, the traffic growth and the modelling, as I say, we have done local data grabs as well. So 2017, we undertook a very comprehensive survey of movements in the town. That will be augmented by further surveys prior to the full business case. But really, just to give you some assurance that Shropshire Council is not allowed as project sponsor or proponent to actually make up its own terms of engagement. It has to abide by a national framework. So we're working with DFT on that, and so we're fully sighted on any changes coming down the road. Um, the, the alternatives and the environmental impact and the do minimum, again, as, as I said, they're, they're requirements within an outline business case. Um, the business case states everything from the do minimum, which is just to be glib, sit back and watch the town grind to a halt. I don't think that's a scenario anyone wants to entertain. Uh, and ultimately, the, the best value for money was found in building the road when you consider the outputs more widely that are going to be accruing to the town. Um, where we are in terms of that town connectivity, this is where, where, the, where the links are made. And you made a really interesting point about the, uh, the ability or willingness of cyclists to offset to a brand new route to the north of the town to make that connection. I think it's an opportunity. We're, we're, we're talking to, to a number of groups, um, Extinction Rebellion amongst them, as regards ambition potentially for enhancing the longer and strategic cycle network within the area, within the county and incorporating the town. So that would naturally fall into that area. I think the opportunity which is which can sometimes be missed is I absolutely agree with you that, you know, a cyclist or a walker wants to take the path of least resistance and, le and, and, and least distance um, in itself. The opportunity we have to de-traffic the town is actually going to allow the trips that you say are already being undertaken, which we have credible data to support that. Those trips to be made in a more safe way in a town which has improved air quality and a reduction in the number of accidents and killed and seriously injured. So actually the, the opportunities to increase uptake of cycling and walking for those shorter trips, but actually in a more pleasant and inviting environment. So I think the two are actually interlinked. The building of the road is also uh, the, the mechanism through which the opportunity to enhance walking and cycling uptake is given. And the business case does fully acknowledge the interlinks between the two. Thanks, Matt. Just one supplementary. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go through challenging all of those things. So obviously, the, you know, the, the, the debate will continue. But the, the, the one thing that is, I think, stick, sticking out to me is what what, you've, what effectively you've said is that we are, we've got an outline business case based on a whole bunch of uh, national rules, which we know are going to change. But we're still just continuing. Uh, that That just feels it does feel a bit irresponsible. I mean, I'm not accusing you of irresponsibility. Please don't take it in that way. But I d it does feel like, hang on a minute, if we know the rules are about to change, why are we still planning ahead with putting in a, a planning submission? Why are we still, still spending yet more money on this when we actually know that the whole scenario is going to have to be revisited based on, on new guidance from government? It, that, that really is a concern. Before you respond, Matt, I see that both Steve Davenport and Mark Barrow want to come in. Is it on that particular point or do you want to come in after? Mark, do you want to come in after? Uh, I'll come in after, yeah, Joyce. Yeah, Steve, do you want to come in after? It's not on that particular point. Yeah, OK, carry on, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, Councillor Dean. I, I, you know, we're in a slightly invidious position. This moment in time is something no one foresaw, but I, I can just sort of refer back to an earlier answer where we're, we're going to take the guidance at the point the guidance is issued. To preempt that could potentially prejudice the case that we put forward to DFT until that new rationale is in place. Um, it's something we're keeping a weather eye on. We have regular meetings with DFT, so we're fully sighted on what's coming down the line. Um, and it's incumbent on us to acknowledge the latest advice and adapt and, and change. I think really the, 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 the constraint we have is the existing five year window for delivery. Um, it's incumbent on me to ensure that the council's commitment to deliver the road is made. Um, and that's we're working within that five year window so we don't default on any conditions at this point in time. But um, you do outline an interesting challenge and we are, we are fully aware of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Rob, then I've got Mark and Steve, uh, and I think possibly we will finish there unless anybody's got any burning questions. Uh, Rob. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Rob uh, uh, Gittins, I represent the uh, Cheswardine uh, division. Um, my question is really just around item five of the report, uh, the the table more, more specifically, the um, um, acquisition costs of the of the uh, land. Uh, have we have we got firm agreements from the landowners in question? 
uh, that are obviously they're, they're happy with with uh, what it is that they're, they're wanting to uh, pay and can you foresee any challenges there probably more uh, specifically a, a increase uh, in in land uh, values thank you Apologies, I was on mute. Um, thanks for the, the question, Councillor Gittings. Yeah, um, it, it's a variable until the point at which land is acquired and clean title is with the council. Um, the way that we've managed to um, re-estimate that figure is through engagement with a land team that we have working with all of the key land agents and landowners. Um, we've revised estimates around the, the values of the land on which we sit. Um, it's worth just, just reflecting on the fact that the outline business case had a slightly different alignment. The land take was different, so the actual quantum of land required has been reduced. Now we've managed to um, do some further detailed design on the red line. Um, really, to, to answer your question head on, um, yes, it is a live risk until completion. We're expecting land acquisition through negotiation, but as a risk management approach, we're also running in a compulsory purchase process behind that and everyone is cited on the fact that, that there is full intent with the council to build the road. However, we would prefer clearly to engage through mutual agreement and negotiation, but um, as, a, as a clear and required risk management approach, we've also got compulsory purchase being developed in the background. Could I ask a quick uh, follow-up question, please, Jeff? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I'm sort of looking, looking at the figure. I mean, the, the main head, headline figure there is about one about 1.3 million uh, i mean how many acres of land are we actually looking at to to um um purchase i know you've just said that there will be maybe a slight re reduction but uh what 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 how, how much land uh is it that we're actually looking to um uh, pur purchase please I, I can't. I can follow up with a supplementary written answer in terms of the absolute area, um, which will be resolved at the point of planning application. Um, to give you some indication, I mean, it's sort of self-evident, really, but it's it's just over seven kilometres by around two, three hundred metres on average in width in terms of construction. And then we resort back to a maintained area, which is the highway. So apologies, Councillor Gittins, I can't give you a detailed answer on that, but I can follow up with an overall um, land estimate. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, apologies, Andy Boddington. I seem to have missed you. If you want to come in now and then I'll go to the director and the portfolio holder. Thank you, Joyce. Um, my question is a little to one side of the road. The water resource scheme, um, the flood relief scheme. Matt mentioned this in passing, that it was in the original scheme 15 years ago, or at least was thought about at that point. This to me really is something that we would have thought about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, this sort of giant pond and barrier structure for flood relief. Um, it makes more sense in this day and age to do more work upstream to create greater biodiversity, rewilding real real if you like, and recreational opportunities uh, further up the Severn. So, could we come back and look at this specifically at a future meeting? Because, again, pretty much along Julian's line, lines of his arguments, that the whole agenda is shifting. That what we would have thought about 20 years ago would be a good idea. We now think, actually, we want to do something different. And I really think we should come back and look at this in detail. If you'd like to make that a recommendation uh, when we come to the end of this item, Andy, we'll we'll see what everyone thinks, if that's OK. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you. Um, uh, Mark, then Steve, and um, Nick Farsi has just creeped in there. So we'll write <coughs> your question when you come in. Mark. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to um, stress the point, really, that, that in terms of uh, this piece of infrastructure, um, when we think about the impacts that it has, what we've also got to think about is is the, the scale of time that those impacts are going to cover as well, uh, and how important it is to uh, Shrewsbury and Shropshire, I think, particularly to think about that as a strategic uh, piece of infrastructure going forward. So if I think, for example, in, in my working lifetime, the population of Shropshire has grown by 75,000. You know, what we've got to think about is infrastructure that, that puts the county in the best position in the longer term not just the shorter term. Um, so just to be clear, in terms of government targets on emissions, we've got 100% uh, zero emissions by uh, 2050 and new petrol and diesel cars will be banned by 2040. 
but there are no plans to ban existing petrol and diesel cars and we'll still get congestion with electric or hydrocarbon vehicles whether they're you know as we would today with carbon vehicles it just means they won't be pushing out carbon so there's a bit about how the place works efficiently so i think the bit for me to stress is that this investment um stacked up in its own right on a range of measures and the additional things that matt's talked about are in addition it doesn't mean the case was wrong at the outset it doesn't mean that uh, things weren't considered it means that in many ways um, the cost benefit analysis on this road as it stood at the time it was submitted uh, blew the kind of upper limits on on dft's modeling anyway that's how come it got funded um, so i think we, we should kind of travel with a bit of confidence here that all of the additionality that we've talked about whether it's about work with the river seven partnership big town plan our own plans for active travel they're all additionality it doesn't mean it was wrong to start with i think we just need to really stress that uh chair to everybody because i wouldn't want a message going out that there was anything that was kind of wrong with that initial case it, it wasn't wrong at all uh, a matter the team have been working really hard i think to consolidate that and actually i think for me the bit here is we're actually traveling with a real degree of confidence about about a scheme that will deliver positive benefits thank you very much mark um Yes, we're now going to Steve Davenport. Yes, hi, uh, Chairman. I'm very much on the same theme, really. Um, we've got to remember that vehicles won't diminish, as, as Mark says. What will change is what they're run on. In fact, they, the vehicles are increasing and parts of our roles increasing at 15% a year, uh, which is averages uh, 5% uh, a year over the rest of the country. But it, we've got uh, we'll have gas, hydrogen, um, we'll have electric and probably other things uh, in the future. But definitely things will increase. But the main reason, uh, not just for the villages surrounding uh, Shrewsbury, but is to take vehicles away from the town centre. Really, this wasn't originally, it was. It thought it was a good idea 40 years ago. It will still be a good idea in another 40 years. So there's no right and wrong time. If there is a right time, it's now. Keep the vehicles out of Shrewsbury, increase the park and ride back to two, two and a half million uses, usages a year and let's get the vehicles so, uh, out of the town. That's the green way forward for everybody. Thank you. OK, thank you. Right. Last question from Nick, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I don't think the chat function's working very well. I did actually oh, just speak clear. half an hour ago. Um, oh. And it was really just to pick up the point that uh, Councillor Andy Boddington made. Um, it's in section eight of, um, uh, uh, of Matt's report. Um, and maybe the information is available somewhere else, but I don't think it's in this report. I do think we need to look at the um, cost and environmental damage um, in reducing flood risk downstream to the properties upstream, um, both in Shropshire and indeed across the border in Mid Wales. Um, because um, as I understand it, holding water back effectively means flooding land and properties and productive agricultural land um, upstream from the barrier, wherever that is. Um, now, maybe overall it's worth it, um, but I don't think we should simply say, oh, we're reducing flood risk to nearly 3,000 homes downstream um, without balancing that. And I'm not saying it's equivalent, um, but there will be a cost upstream because um, it doesn't just affect the main river, it presumably will affect all the tributaries, which will also be flooding to a far greater extent than they do now. So if we're going to look at this, please, uh, in a more detailed report, can we please um, have some sort of estimate, some sort of uh, impact assessment upstream from the proposed barrier as well as downstream? That's the question. Yeah. OK, right, I've got Steve Brown and Mark Barrow that want to reply and speak now. Uh, are you both speaking on the same thing on Can, this? I'm, I'm just addressing uh, Councillor Bard's Liz and Andy Boddington's question, if that's OK. OK, 
Carry on. Yep. So just to be clear, so there is modelling work going on now uh, with the Environment Agency uh, on all of what Councillor Bardley has just talked about. Uh, that's due to complete uh, early in the new year. I think, Chair, as soon as we've got that sort of information, we can then find a way of bringing it to, to the committee and, and members can, can be reassured about that. So oh. as soon as we've got it, we, we'll, we'll work to, to, to bring that forward as soon as we can. Have you got a rough time scale on that, Mark? Uh, yeah, so um, there's a first stage consultation that will complete at Christmas. The idea is we take on board then uh, all of the feedback from uh, communities in relation to all sorts of options. That then gets worked up in models early in the new year and then that will get played back uh, something like the end of March. So sometime in the spring, Chair, I think we could kind of schedule some some item for discussion here. OK, thank you very much. Steve, is your, do you want to speak on what Nick has just said? It was, it was it was just to pick up on point that um, Councillor Davenport raised, if that's OK, Chair. Okay. Yeah. It was just to follow up on that important point that Councillor Davenport raised and just to be sort of mindful that you know, the North West Relief Road, as important as it is, you know, it, it won't impact in isolation on the, on the town of Shrewsbury as well. So if we're bringing in or working towards a uh, 20 mile an hour outside the school, looking at active travel, looking at school streets. Mm -hmm. We had a successful meeting last night with Shrewsbury members and Shrewsbury Town Council on low traffic neighbourhoods. There will be a displacement of that traffic, bringing in the park and ride. So all of those interlinking cogs, you know, need to be need to be thought through as well. So North West Relief Road is the is, um, key strategic project of the council, but other other items and other activities within the town are not happening in isolation. And, you know, that displacement will cause an issue and, and will need to be thought through. So other factors as well will, will bring into play as well. OK, thank you very much. Um, just some questions for you, Mark. I could ask Matt, but I think I'll ask you uh, just a yes or a no if that's possible. This is an easy one for you. Uh, can you give me assurance that the scheme is progressing well and in particular with regard to meeting its budget and scheduled completion dates? Yes. Well, you didn't move your lips then, you froze. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. Ensure the scheme successfully mitigates against the environmental impact of its construction and operation. Yes. Thank you. And also um, that the road enables and supports walking and cycling both along the road itself and across the road and elsewhere in Shrewsbury. Yes, all of those. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good meeting, isn't it? OK, uh, on that note, I think I'll move two recommendations. And um, Andy, you want to add something? Are you still there, Andy? I'm still here, yeah. Right, OK. Well, the recommendations as they stand at the moment uh, is to note the North West Release Road budget and programme updates and B is to note that further reports will be brought back to scrutiny annually for the next two years and then six monthly or quarterly as required during the preparation of the full business case contract of procurement and construction phase. Um, what do you want to add to this? And are there so, any other, anybody else got any recommendations they feel should be there? Sorry, yeah, to add, to, add to that, Joyce, that um, Mark has already indicated he would do this, yeah. that the, this scrutiny committee reviews the Seven, Seven Valley Water Management Scheme yes. early in the new year. OK, if we can make sure, Daniel, that we put that on our work programme uh, at the end, uh, we'll add that to the, the recommendations as well. Um, I'd like to take um, a vote on that, please. Uh, Andy? Oh, sorry. Yes. Can I propose an additional recommendation? That scrutiny that we do the likely changes in the policy, the national policy story, yeah. which are going to clearly impact on the difference between the outline business case and the full business case at the earliest opportunity with a view to seeing you know, what, what, what this means for the project. So what would you like to see in the recommendation exactly? Uh, the, the, well, effectively, it's a recommendation that we agree to to come back to to review the well, that we have a report on the likely um, uh, changes in, in national in the national policy and advice. Flowing for, you know, since the outline business case so that we can see what likely impact that's going to have on on the full business case. 
OK, Daniel, can you find some words on that one for us, please? We'll do, Chair. OK, so um, working on that recommendation, Andy's and the two that are already there. Can we take a vote on that? Andy Boddington. Approve. Julian Dean. Apologies, uh, what, could you ask that question again? I'm, I'm just sorry. asking uh, support for the recommendations. In Yours, two, Andy. You and, yes, 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 and the two that are there. Yes, yes, happy to. Thank you very much. Rob Gittins. Uh, yes. Nick Bardsley. Yes. Paul Milner. Yes. Dan Morris. Yes. Pam Mosley. Oh. Paul Wynn. Yes. Thank you. Oh, you are there, Paul. Hello. Yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK, thank you all very much. So that's uh, those recommendations are carried. If we can now move on to item eight, Shrewsbury Shopping Centre update. And we have Haley Owen, Interim Head of Economic Growth. Uh, if you can introduce yourself and present the item, please. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm Hayley Owen, Interim Head of Economic Growth at the Council. Um, thank you for allowing me to present this report to you today. Um, if it's OK, Chair, in the same vein that Matt, Matt took you through the report, I'll just take you through the highlights um, and the key areas that we'd like to, to highlight to the committee um, and obviously any questions at, at the end. So I'll um, uh, just, just to talk you through, the purpose of the report is to obviously highlight performance, uh, progress on the next phases of development, including the strategic development framework and the big town plan for Shrewsbury. Um, so I'd like to highlight some of the key sort of challenges and issues um, that have have hit the high street this year um, and progress made to date um, on the agreed business plan and progress against that um, for the shopping centres. So as you're aware, obviously high streets have been facing sort of exceptional and unprecedented challenges this year. And particularly for Shrewsbury, um, you'll be aware of the flooding clearly in February and the impact that's had on the town, followed shortly by the COVID um, impacts and restrictions. Um, these have seen significant impact on how the town has performed, although the town has continued to perform well against national picture in terms of footfall. Clearly that has declined against last year's um, footfall levels. Um, for the shopping centre specifically, it's been down about 35 to 40 percent um, on average compared to last year. However, that's slightly up against the national picture, which has seen a drop between 45 and 55 percent. So continue to uh, to progress well against the national picture. However, you know, continually increased challenges. Um, I wanted to draw you to 5.2 in the report, <clears throat> which sets these out in a little bit more detail and a summary. Um, I won't go into the, every single line within this, but clearly when the um, shopping centres had to close due to uh, the lockdown last time, um, there were a number of shops that continued <coughs> to stay open as they are considered to be essential such as home bargains, Marks and Spencers, etc. Um, the social distancing measures um, which were put in place and, and particularly within the shopping centres rightly limited capacity to the centres, ensuring that we were um, maintaining a safe and uh, secure environment when the centres reopened was a priority. Um, as the lockdown measures uh, reduced, there has been uncertainty and lack of consumer confidence in returning generally to public places. Um, however, you know, we've made huge effort in terms of social distancing measures within Shrewsbury, as with all our market towns, to support um, people and businesses to operate effectively. There have been supply chain implications um, for retailers this year, uh, delays in stock availability due to sort of within the UK and the import export markets, and that has had an impact on how businesses are able to function and supply. As I mentioned, the severe flooding in February has caused uh, loss of trade or damage to premises within the town centre. Um, and there's been sort of significant increase in high street stores which have entered into administration or CBA's company voluntary agreement arrangements. Um, and as to note, again, um, high street um, has been impacted by the increase in online purchases, which shot up to a record high of 32.8% um, of retail uh, purchases being made online in May this year, according to the Office of National Statistics. 
that percentage had fallen down to about 28% in July, um, but is markedly higher by about 10% than the previous July. Um, so I just think those are key elements to note in terms of the way that retail and high streets are functioning. Um, clearly, that's that's a, a, a consequence of the COVID impact um, and, and levels were beginning to drop in terms of online. Um, however, obviously, as today we're entering a new uh, a new lockdown, um, we will be monitoring that closely to see the impact and change that continues on that vein. Um, however, you know, it's really important to note that Shrewsbury, you know, has been doing an awful lot in terms of shopping centres and as a town as a whole. So the Shrewsbury Recovery Task Force has been in place, which has implemented several initiatives between them as part of the Big Town Plan board and partnerships so including um, ourselves with Shropshire Council, the Business Improvement District and the Town Council um, and that has uh, seen some significantly uh, important uh, implementations to support town and the community to recover. So there's been the Bounce Back Shrewsbury campaign, social distancing measures, working closely with our highways colleagues, uh, movement recovery plans and, and general sort of support to support businesses to operate safely. So, um, you know, some really, you know, whilst there is, there is significant challenges, there have been some really, you know, positive moves and, and Shrewsbury does continue to perform well against a national picture in that sense. Um, we have been continuing work specifically in the shopping centres during this period. Um, so um, looking at the kind of three centres very quickly, there was a major refurbishment plan for the Darwin Centre which was around the mid-level of the shopping centres to, um, and they have now opened, I'm very pleased to say, some brand new toilet facilities and changing places facilities, the newest and most high-tech in the town, um, which support the needs of the shoppers um, and a brand new sort of family room with um, baby changing um, area, breastfeeding zone, play area and, and dining counter. So, so there's been some significant work at the mid level, including updates to shop fronts. All of this work continued despite the pandemic in a safe and controlled way. Um, also work is beginning on an innovative shopping um, area for independent traders called The Collective within Darwin to help relocate tenants from Pride Hill who may want to move into Darwin and consolidate that work. So um, that that work is continuing and uh, will be with, well, uh, <laughs> this was previously before, before the new lockdown, but we are hoping that will be open in advance of Christmas. Um, and obviously the Shropshire local unit had opened in Darwin over the recent months as well, along with some notable this year opening of sketches and some um, and Molly Suites and, and Meg Hawkins into the Darwin Centre. So some really positive news in terms of uh, movement into Darwin. Pride Hill continues in terms of the repurposing of that project um, and we are uh, working hard to develop that scheme. Um, and Riverside again, which is really important in terms of the reasoning for the purchase of the shopping centres has always been and continues to be about supporting um, and managing and seeing the transition of our town centres and enabling us to, to be at the heart of that and driving that forward in a collective way. So there's been an awful lot of work this year around the strategic development framework for Riverside area, which has been led uh, by a team of LDA Design um, and Krishman and Wakefield for that development advisor advice. Um, we are coming to an end of that work in, over the next couple of months and we will be looking to present that back um, at, by, at the end of the year, early new year back. So that will help set the framework for the uses and um, the opportunities within that development op uh, area of the town. Um, so quite an exciting point and an awful lot of work and, and development with stakeholders has under been undertaken to, to drive that forward. Um, we have been doing some work um, uh, on the Big Town Plan for Shrewsbury with Glen Howells, which is a wider piece of work looking at the rest of the town centre as well. So again, that work is coming to conclusion and we will be looking to bring that forward uh, again in similar timescales into the new year. Um, so I just wanted to sort of conclude um, on that point that, um, you know, the shopping centres, as, as, as the committee and members know, were purchased to help manage that transition, drive forward those opportunities and plans are 
progressing well. Um, clearly, we need to be very mindful of the new lockdown restrictions which have come in place. An awful lot of work, particularly in the shopping centres, is taking place to ensure those traders that are remaining open can do so in a safe um, and controlled way. So, um, you know, there's, there's clearly a new wave that we are managing. And um, yes, on that note, I'll, I'll finish. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Hayley. Nick Bardley. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, it really, my question in my, the, the issue I have with the report, um, and, and I'm, I'm not knocking it at all, um, is I think perhaps an underestimate of the long term trends in retail. Um, every day, seemingly, there is more depressing news about the decline in traditional retail shopping um, and the move towards online. Um, and the events of the last 12, 18 months, the last 12 months particularly, um, with flooding and COVID, uh, may have accelerated that and 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 hopefully they're temporary factors but long term the attraction of online shopping hasn't gone away um, so I think my question which is intended to be fairly fundamental is I do hope <coughs> officers are looking seriously at whether in redeveloping um, Riverside particularly, but also Pride Hill. We're getting the balance right. Um, if we're simply going to try and, you know, reinvent retail and, and, and you know, commercial leisure and so on, um, are, we, are we risking missing the fundamental question is, is the balance right? Should we be looking at far more residential um, because Shrewsbury is still a hugely attractive centre. We've seen, uh, you know, old offices being turned into very comfortable and attractive um, apartments. Um, I hope that's on the agenda for the strategic development framework and that we're not just looking at another form of retail or commercial development. Uh, I. I I, I think we should pay considerable attention to what's happening nationally. I mean, Shrewsbury may be different, but it, it won't be that different. And I don't think we can escape the long the long term um, and fundamental changes in the way people do their shopping. Um, I'd, I'd be grateful for comment on that from Hayley and perhaps Mark as well. Thank you, uh -huh. Chair. Mark wants to come in there, so I'll bring you in, Mark. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I, I can reassure you, Councillor Bardsley, that all, all of those things have fully been kind of taken into account uh, and thought about, actually. Um, and I know you just said, you know, change is going on nationally. It's a global phenomenon in many ways. But um, reality is that's why we bought the centres. We bought the centres to help manage this transition and make sure that it just didn't kind of drift in an organic way. Uh, and I think the essence of kind of the message there is that um, Shrewsbury holds up really well, actually, um, in, in a range of ways. Um, but what we're working towards is, is actually a model which is about experience um, you know uh, the great day out you know a place for families to go to do mixed things and maybe one of them is retail uh, I think our high streets have kind of you know the purpose of our high streets is changing fundamentally and I think that's where your question was going uh, and we're really cognizant of that so the bit here is well, what else is there to do what else can we do to kind of mitigate that impact manage that transition uh, and support that change interestingly um, you know, think, you know, for example, Marks and Spencers in Shrewsbury is their fourth best traded in the country. You know, there's a lot of really positives. Uh, there are some traders in the town centre that have actually improved their cash position um, this year, even though footfall's been down. Um, about 81% of the businesses in the centre of Shrewsbury are independent. So there's a lot that we're doing to kind of support that growth, that uniqueness, that kind of quality. 
um, and that sense of, you know, um, Shrewsbury is a destination. Um, in terms of the wider plans, uh, you know, you're right that we are thinking about all of that kind of diversification opportunity, whether it's about residential uh, in Riverside, whether it's about additional hotels, whether it's about additional kind of leisure uses, all of that is central to this. So there will be a rebalancing uh, and retail will be rebalanced, but that's at the heart of our plans. Okay, thank you very much. Are you, are you happy with that response, Nick? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, 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 I am reassured. Um, it, it's just that the danger is that um, <laughs> the the purchase of the shopping centres, I think, um, you know, actually was motivated by all sorts of things. Um, and I don't think really any of us foresaw quite the um, changes that have taken place in the last two years. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I, I think we need to be quite nimble on our feet here um, and think, well, if these long term trends, yeah, Shrewsbury probably is a bit better than a, lot, a number of other places, but we can't altogether escape the the fact that it's so easy um, and of course the last few months have demonstrated that uh, sadly uh, all too well it is so easy to do practically all your shopping online um, and and of course now we're being reminded of it again for another four weeks so um, I, 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 I fear Shrewsbury is not going to escape um, national and as Mark says um, world trends uh, moving away from people going shopping in the traditional way um, so I, I i think we we do need to be quite radical in what we are thinking of um you know before we commit ourselves to to new plans okay thank you thank you for that nick um if we go to rob gittins now uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Chair Rob uh, 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 Gittins here. Um, the the last time we had an update uh, on the shopping centres, um, I asked the Section 151 officer um, in regards to pro, pro, pro rejected ROIs and yields. Uh, I'm still yet to get an answer on that, and I'm not sure whether there's an uh, officer here uh, who can who can. Um, um, just tell just tell us what those pro pro rejected ROIs and yields will be in the uh, future. There, um, my second question is just around Pride Hill. I know the last time we had an update, there was talk around trying to a, a attract a um, a um, um, cinema tr a chain in. Um, is that still the case? Uh, that sort of does link quite well into what Nick Nick uh, Bard Bardsley was just. Uh, uh, saying um, uh, about the change, uh, the, the, the change, and just looking at what it is we need to uh, do. So, if we could just get an answer on 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 where we in, in the visage that the Pride Hill going, especially if we can't a a attract a a, a a cinema chain. Considering as well that a lot of things now are going on online. Um, you got Netflix, your Disney channels, your, your Amazon Primes. Um, I'm not quite sure how much of a future a, a cinema a, a actually has, but uh, if I get an a, a answer on that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Barrow wants to come in and respond. Uh, OK, thank you, Chair. Um, I haven't got the ROI figures with me today, but uh, we are heading for a report to Cabinet in December on all of that. So just to reassure members, you'll see uh, stuff in that sense. Um, there is an interesting bit, of course, as we're now in another period of lockdown, as you'll appreciate, uh, we as a, almost a commercial landlord are working with all of our tenants uh, and there are some individual arrangements that are being made, as you would imagine, because some of them are more vulnerable than others. You would you'd want us to think about the greater picture. So there's all sorts of kind of commercial bits in the middle of that, which we're now back into for for this month. So, you know, let's see what we're able to tell uh, members in December. But, you know, our plan is that we'll give you all all of that at that point. Uh, my point uh, in re response to Councillor Bardsley's uh, question was actually uh, very much that that whole wider leisure piece. Um, 
there is a cinema part of that that is being looked at and um, interestingly the feedback from the research that we've done and how we've kind of been testing this with the market is there is still going to be a market for a good quality experience in that sense uh, and we have a real direct input in that already by seeing what we've what footfall and traffic we've got through the old market hall cinema you know that kind of really high quality niche type of offer seems to be landing well uh, and the other thing is of course we're thinking about you know the population that we're planning for and and their needs so this isn't just about young people going and sit in front of blockbusters actually there's also that kind of quality film experience using the back catalogue having themed events there's all sorts of stuff like that that's being thought about and planned about at the moment so um you know we're, 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 just to reassure you all of that is is being looked at very thoroughly thank you uh councillor julian dean Thank you very much, uh, Julian Dean from Porter and Shrewsbury. So, I, I, yeah, I wanted to develop the points that, that Nick Blasley made, really, because I think that while, whilst uh, Mark Barrow came back and, and emphasised the, the experience issue, and I, I un completely understand that, I, I do think that the housing side is is, is perhaps still being uh, a little bit under uh, underdeveloped in terms of, well, to use a pun, um, I mean, we have Cornovi, you know, should should there not be a plan here to 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 really seriously think about, you know, we, if you look at York, they're, they're now taking the opportunity to build zero carbon homes in the centre of town where there is actually an opportunity to do something which is effectively car free living. You know, there's a real that that, that that feels to me like a real opportunity. We also know that uh, that, you know, that in terms of a green recovery, we need to be borrowing to spend. That's that's, you know, everybody's talking about that. We've just had an announcement about new quantitative easing from the government. The council is also in a position to do that. 1.5% borrowing, as I understand it, if we were capital in, uh, for, for investing in housing. Should we not be really making taking the most of the opportunity of the of the estate that we own? And actually, unless we really push the boat out, we've got all these other units around the town which we don't currently own are there not also opportunities for for that being you know for a bigger picture uh, using Cornovi to really begin to sort of bring people back to living in the town centre because that presumably is as, along with the experience that's the that's the future for town centres and that allows us to do sustainable homes without having to build on greenfield sites because you know that and, and we can do the sorts of flats and, and, and stuff that, that is suitable for younger families or young people and is affordable. So I think there's huge opportunities in the centre of town if, we, if we're grasping the nettle. Thank you. Um, if I can just mention, Daniel has just flagged up to me that they do have similar developments in Chester, apparently. Thank you, Daniel. Um, <laughs> Did you yeah, want to Chair, can, I, can I just, can I just uh, answer Councillor Dean? Yeah, uh, just to reassure you that uh, we are looking at that fully. So this is a paper about the retail centres in particular in relation to the redevelopment of the Riverside area. There's, there's an element there that we're looking at that will contain, you know, um, quite a significant amount of, of, of residential potentially. Uh, just as a flag chair, uh, we hope to land the master plan for all of this early in the new year and maybe that's something to think about as a future program item for this committee to to look at that uh, quite happy to kind of come along and share that with you and you know then you can the, with the evidence there that you can see that you know what, what I've just kind of hopefully reassured you about is absolutely central in a wider bit though there's another bit which is and council Dean's right to highlight it the significant opportunities in terms of spaces above shops for example in a wider sense and that is something we're cognizant about. It is something Ian Kilby is looking at, you know, in terms of what planning incentives could we could we could 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 we help um, create? Uh, and then, of course, we've got a, a real tool in our box to help make things happen if the market struggles with that through something like Conovi. So that, that's a wider pit, bit than today. But just to reassure you, we are looking at that. And actually, this isn't just a Shrewsbury story. This is a market town story, isn't it, in some ways, Chair? Oh. Do, you, do you think that would be ready for the uh, January meeting, 28th of January, or do you think that would be, wouldn't be ready and the 18th of March meeting would be better? Uh, probably March, simply because um, the process of going through Cabinet will take place hopefully early, before scrutiny then, if that's okay, okay Chair. Okay, that's fine. If we can Are you pulling faces there, Daniel? <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, the, the reason I'm putting faces, uh, and I'll come back to this, uh, the next item on the agenda is um, that um, 
we are uh, actually much might be within the pre-election period, and I would suspect perhaps bringing exciting new developments to scrutiny in the pre-election period <laughs> <laughs> may not be wise. Actually, I think we've had this discussion, haven't we? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for pointing that out. It couldn't be reported on, of course, because of PERDA. Um, Councillor Paul Wynn. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to back up Nick Bardsley uh, on what he was saying. I do agree with him, but hearing all the arguments, not arguments, but what Mark put forward, I feel that we're in a situation of moving sand here. And um, I think we want to give it a bit more time. Let's not rush. We've got to see what happens with COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's in good hands in with Mark and his team. Uh, so I feel, yeah, more confident what I've heard from Mark as well. Okay, I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andy Boddington. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a very quick point that we're concentrating at the moment on Shrewsbury. It's taken a great deal of investment so far and will take more investment. I'm not arguing against that, but I would just like to make the point that it is an opportunity cost against the market towns. We're starved of investment. We can't get the money to improve our park and ride, which is probably the worst in the country. Uh, and you know, with another 11 million pounds perhaps to go into the shopping centres, that would pay for Ludlow's park and ride more than 20 times over. Thank you. Um, I think that was a bit negative and doesn't actually relate to the item we're discussing, Andy. Thank you very much, though. Um, Pam Mosley. Thank you, Chair. Um, my one's about the moving of um, retailers from Pride Hill to the collective in the Darwin. Um, could the officers report on how many have moved and how many have declined the offer. I understand that Ryman's have now closed, who could have moved. I've been told anecdotally that it's the only shop they have closed nationally, so it's not part of a wider trend. And it, I think feel that shop is a loss to the town. It's the only one of its type in the town centre for office supplies, goods, stationery, etc. I mean, we've got Smith's, but that's a fairly limited offer. So could we have a, re a verbal update on how many have moved, how many are not moving, uh, etc. I haven't been to uh, look at the site yet, not sure it's open. I've been trying to keep out of shopping centres really at the moment for obvious reasons. Thank you. OK, thank you. Do, do you want to comment on that, Hayley or Mark? <coughs> yeah, I'm happy to come in um, if Mark wants to, to add to it. But um, thank you, uh, Councillor Mosley. I think in response to the collective, um, up to 70% uh, of the collective um, is now um, has tenants who are looking to move into there, particularly the independent shops from Pride Hill. Um, so it's about bringing them together and working more in a kind of market space environment to support each other. Um, so, but we, we are more confident that that's going to be even up to 100% shortly. So uh, the shopping centre team are working hard on, on that in terms of moving. Um, some of the individual negotiations with um, with retailers within Pride Hill, so Ryman's, for example, um, I won't get into the commercial conversation around that, but um, you know we have those conversations. We have um, our agents employed to have those negotiations and conversations. We absolutely want to move people and support them within the town. That is our prime objective if they want to do that. Um, and a lot of it comes down to how shops are performing individually within a town um, and, and and other details that sit behind that as to um, where they want to be and, and if we have suitable spaces. But it's absolutely to reassure committee, you know, our objective is to maintain as many of the retailers within the town centre as possible and um, moving those ones that wish to move and finding the right accommodation for them and um, the collective is quite an exciting opportunity um, and you know a, a significant amount of the uh, independents within Pride Hill are moving into that space um, and are looking forward to that um, opening to support them um, collectively so we will keep um, keep members updated on progress with that project specifically. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, can you give clarity on the likely purpose of the Pride Hill Shopping Centre? Absolutely. I mean, as Mark um, outlined, it's very much about um, 
that mix of uses in terms to support the experience within the town centre. So it's around leisure, uh, office, potential mix of civic uses. So there's there's a there's a range of opportunity there that's being explored. Um, and, you know, we are very cognizant of the change in markets, and that is particularly why we have um, sort of retail expertise working with us on this to understand the market trends, what's coming out, you know, um, and we have to be flexible. I think that's a really important point um, through the strategic development framework and through anything we're doing with Pride Hill, you know, being being responsive and having that element of control that we do have through our beneficial ownership of the shopping centres. Um, given um, the Riverside development and the proposals for that are uh, imminent, uh, would you come back to the committee and tell us uh, more about this when the proposals are emerging for that site, please? Absolutely. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. We, could, uh, um, make, we have no recommendations actually on this particular item. Uh, it's just for noting, but if anybody feels that there should be something. Uh, yes, Paul. Yeah, could I, I, uh, sorry, I did send it by. Could I just ask a question? Uh, um, the, the question is really is that uh, some of the market towns own properties and uh, they have they have been asked to give um, their tenants um, uh, rent holidays or uh, to help them in that way, especially the independent shops. Mm -hmm. um, are, are we receiving many uh, expressions of help? Uh, and if if they if they did, I'm not saying this is going to be a, the same for everybody. But if if they did str struggling, would we would give them rent holidays, or would we look at how would we judge whether they they may get that, or what what actually is being put into place to help independent shops? Okay, Chair, would you like me to answer that? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's. I mean, the re the response is that for properties that we own we do treat it in a case by case basis uh, and we are uh, allowing some rent holidays in some cases you know in some cases rolling that up of course some businesses have been able to attract some of the grant schemes to date and some haven't so there's a little bit about that in the background but but one of the things that we're really conscious of is that um, you know, this is about also about helping businesses survive, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so so to some extent, some people are still paying business rate, for example, and we're uh, making more flexible arrangements on rentals, you know, so, in, you know, there is there is a, a double income kind of impact there in some ways. Uh, so just to reassure you, we're kind of working very kind of, um, you know, um, proactively with businesses to help them as best we can. Okay. Yeah, that, that, thank, thank you. Mark. As, as I said, this is a very worrying time for for businesses at the moment. And, uh, you know, as I said, obviously Town Council own, own property and um, Edinburgh Wool is now closed in Oswald Street. Another building has gone. Um, and it's really hard for the independent shops at the moment, uh, the businesses uh, to keep their head above water. So any help we can give them, uh, as, you, as you said, it's it's being done on a case for case. Uh, but any help that we can give them on uh, uh, council tax or rent review just for a period of time until just to keep them ahead above water really um, and i think that's important that we lead on that as a council okay thank you very much paul um rob gittins is asking uh could he recommend officers come back to the next meeting with projected rois and yields for when the developments have finished uh, I'm quite happy with that. Um, is it a recommendation or is it just well, something? Chair, if I can help, if I can yes. help shape that, if I can help yeah. shape that and, and yeah. summarise what, what Hayley's given you and maybe this, this could help shape future recommendations. So what we're looking at is a pretty well a complete redevelopment of everything Riverside. People know that. So so there's a master plan around that and there's a set of series, series of kind of uh, ambitions for different forms of development there. So that's one chunk of work in its own yeah. right. There's yeah. another bit which is repurposing Pride Hill Centre, which Hayley's yeah. just outlined, uh, yeah. and that's a discrete bit. And then the third bit then is the consolidation of, of retail in in the best retail asset in the town, which is the Darwin Centre. Yeah. So to some extent, there isn't, I don't think, a single answer to councillor um, um, to, the, to, the, to the recommendations and some of the questions that have come forward. But actually, if we could okay. think about how we chunk that down into those three areas, yeah. there may be discrete things that you can look at each of those in their three distinct spaces. So we'll talk about ultimately the performance of a retail asset in Darwin and its return and investment. And then there'll be a different story about how we're going to get value out of Riverside and Pride Hill. Okay, well, uh, I would um, if, would 
request that members of the committee note the report, which is what it's for, and then uh, perhaps Daniel and I can have a chat about this and the best way to deal with these, because they are three separate things, even though they're all joined up. Um, so I'll have a chat with Daniel and yeah, yeah. have you got a thought on that at the moment, Daniel? Yes, I have chair. I think I think I, I think I understand what Mark's saying here, which is essentially that, that because the, the the three projects are so uh, so different and, and have such different outcomes, that talk about return on investment for for, for the whole thing is 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 is, is somewhat pointless. Um, so. You know, by, by all means, I think there's a discussion to be had in our work programme about when we bring these items back. And, and obviously, um, when information is available is only one of the confounding factors here. The other one is, of course, the pre-election period, which is That's sort of cool. rapidly yeah. emerging. So so I do think the needs, we, we, we do need to, I don't, I don't think there's a decision that we can necessarily make right now. I think it just needs a little bit of thought and a bit more work before we can uh, approach that properly. So is that uh, okay? <laughs> Are all, oh, I can see a thumbs up there. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> if I can um, right, move this on, and, and I don't, we don't need to take a vote on this uh, unless somebody's got a, an issue with the way forward on it. Is everybody happy? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. In that case, we, we will move on to the next item and the last item, which is item nine, the work programme. Uh, so if we can all have a look at the work programme. I'm sure you've already looked at it. Is there anything that anybody thinks they want to add to that, bearing in mind that we do have limited time and limited meetings? And actually, the, the items on, on there at the moment are quite chunky ones. Uh, is there anything anybody wants to add? Or is there anything anything at all? Yes, Nick? Um, thank you. Uh, presumably, Daniel will update that in the light of the decisions made today, um, yeah. because we've, we've 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 had a couple of things where there's a commitment to come back in January, presumably the January meeting, um, and um, you know I think those those are very important reviews that we've yeah. commissioned today. So yeah. if Daniel could just say yes, they'll be included, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think you, you, Nick's quite right. Yeah, I, I think um, you, you have inadvertently created yourself an all-day meeting there with all sorts of large, chunky items that you want to response on. Um, and, and in particular as well, uh, whilst you, you, you wish to look at the seven flood alleviation scheme, I would point out that the Community Survey Committee is already looking at quite some depth in terms of the emergency response to flooding. Um, so I, I would just take care that, um, that that work doesn't impinge upon the work of the Community Survey Committee, you're not duplicating yourself. So, so I think um, there's also as well, really, I mean, uh, I think the our 18th of March meeting is almost certainly likely to fall just within the pre-election period, which is going to really um, remove some of the immediate topics from the agenda that just wouldn't be appropriate. So I suspect that meeting would be fairly anodyne by comparison. So that in effect only leaves you with two meetings, both of which are quite full at the moment. Yeah. So uh, there's no reason why, of course, we can't hold more meetings. Um, and, and I do recognise that obviously the committee has asked for this information. So I think rather than um, trying to make some snap decisions now, uh, only to have to revisit them uh, in a future meeting, what I can do if you want is there's no reason why we can't continue this work outside the meeting. And I can always, having worked with you, Chair, and with Mark, um, uh, revise and redraft a work programme to submit round to the committee for, for improvement in principle and then obviously we can approve it fully um, in, in a public meeting, in a meeting in public in December. Does that does that strike you as a as a, as a reasonable response? That sounds good. Yeah, that's Sorry, Right. Um, the recommendations on, on the work programme are agree the proposed committee work programme attached. Note the current task and finish groups attached. Um, we did say earlier that task and finish groups were uh, actually the, they're just, is it just um, the one Julian's doing that's come to a halt, Daniel? Uh, uh, no, there are, there are several task and finish groups that are, are currently in play or drawing to a conclusion or um, have just uh, existed for quite some time. So uh, I think, um, 
by all means, we can know that they're, that, that they're in place still at the moment, but I think there are efforts to absorb some of that work um, into committee structures in order to uh, make more effective use of officer time. Okay, uh, and recommend other topics. Well, as we said, we really, other than what we said today, that we won't be adding any other topics because uh, it's full. So, if I can uh, take a vote, is everybody happy on that? Andy Buddington? Yeah. Julian, yeah. Julian Dean. Rob Gittins? So, yes, fine. Nick Bardsley? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Paul Milner? Yes. Dan Morris? Yes, fine. Pam Mosley. Paul yes. Wynn. Yes, fine. Yeah, and uh, if I can just advise everybody to uh, stay with this, because after we've discussed the date and time of the next meeting, uh, we'll have exclusion of the press. So we have the final item at the end. OK, thank you very much. That's carried. Uh, item 10, date and time of next meeting of the committee. Uh, Daniel, please can you confirm if the meeting is needed in December 2020? Uh, as far as I'm aware, that yes, we will need to. Uh, we, we, we still intend to carry on with that meeting. That's fine. And the meeting after that is scheduled for 10 o'clock on Thursday, 28th of January. Uh, we now come to item 11 exclusion of press and public. We now need to resolve that in accordance with the provision of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972 and paragraph 10.4. Five of the Council's access to information rules, the public and press be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following item. Unless anyone indicates differently, I will assume that all are happy to exclude press and public and we will now end the broadcast and conclude the exempt business in private.